Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about a kind of a niche story. A story in regards to what happened on the moon just a few months ago. Something we've briefly discussed in one of the videos, and something I've briefly discussed in one of the posts on YouTube, but something we didn't really get to talk about because there was really not much to talk about. Now there is, and it's visible right here in this picture. It's a double crater. And if you know about the story, you might already know what created this. In that other video and in the original post, we talked about the potential collision with the moon of what seems to be a relatively old booster from one of the SpaceX missions. Specifically the one that was responsible for doing this incredible launch a few years ago. But it was pretty quickly established that that's not actually the case. SpaceX had nothing to do with this and their booster actually re-entered Earth a long time ago. And so I wanted to talk a little bit more about this, what created this, and the more incredible story behind how all of this was found. And once again, all of this kind of starts on Twitter, with another really interesting post by a really interesting astronomer. The astronomer Bill Gray, who runs this website known as Project Pluto, and who's also responsible for creating this relatively incredible software, technically commercial software, that's able to track a lot of different objects in the solar system and that's able to predict their positions with quite an extreme precision. The technique that now has improved so much in the last few years, not just from his software, but from a lot of other software developed by other astronomers as well. And so quite a lot of different space debris, specifically from different rocket launches, is now being actively tracked by many of these types of software. And the safety of the astronauts on the ISS directly depends on this. But Bill Gray's software has even been able to predict potential collisions with various meteors before they even happened. And just under one year ago, his software reported that something else was missing from some of its data. The object suddenly disappears because it seems to have collided with the moon. And specifically, the orbital trajectory of this object was actually intersecting with the moon, meaning that it's most likely going to collide with the moon directly. Now that's not something that's unusual though. As a matter of fact, in the last few years, or more like in the last few decades, NASA has spent quite a lot of time trying to discover various collisions on the moon from various objects that we launched to space. As a matter of fact, here's a composite image that was created by some of the JPL scientists showing us 12 separate locations of 12 separate objects, with some of them from iconic missions such as the Apollo 13, 14, 15 and 17. Although in this particular case, some of them took years to find. The scientists kind of knew where they should end up, but discovering the actual crater took quite a long time. But you can actually go on the separate website created by these scientists to discover some of the other locations and some of the other objects. This is in the description below, but here you can kind of go and see some of the locations for all of these different boosters, all of these different landing sites, and even see some of the tracks from some of the missions such as the Lunahout mission from the Soviet space program. The visual signs of which were discovered by the iconic mission that's currently orbiting the moon, the LRO, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. The mission that's been here for just over a decade and that's already been able to create so many different interesting maps and discover so much interesting data. It also was able to take some really incredible pictures of the moon, like this right here, the Tycho's Crater Central Peak that creates this beautiful shadow that you can see on the surface of the moon. Not to mention some of the most accurate topography maps we have so far. But because the mission is still active and has actually been even extended by NASA for at least a few years, even right now it's currently mapping the moon and is seeing the differences that seem to happen every month or so. And that's because according to some of the scientists behind the mission, it takes about 4 weeks for the mission to return to the same spot as it sort of orbits around the moon in a polar orbit. In other words, if you were to look at it from this perspective, it sort of goes around the moon this way and ends up mapping everything as the moon spins around. So basically it gets to sort of map the entire surface with time. Time after time, pretty much every month, it receives a completely new picture. And because it's been doing this for a few years, the scientists have now been able to discover pretty much all of the major locations, including the locations for the Apollo landing missions. And in case you ever wondered, this is sort of what the Apollo landing sites look like from outer space. What you're actually seeing is the landing stage that's still left on the moon even today. And so basically this particular stage is still visible from the surface of the moon, but only visible as a tiny tiny dot right there. But anyway, back to the prediction of that collision. So his software identified that the collision is going to happen in March of 2022, a few months ago. 
And it was very accurate, because NASA has also confirmed that something is going to be colliding with the moon. But they weren't sure what it was. It wasn't SpaceX though, but it didn't take them long to figure out that it was very likely the Chinese mission from a few years ago. The mission known as Chang'e 5T1. Chang'e 5T1 rocket booster was a 2014 launch of an experimental robotic spacecraft that was essentially laying a groundwork for the then successful Chang'e 5 mission. And because of the orbital parameters and because of everything else involved in this case, this most likely was the culprit behind the collision. But interestingly, right after the announcement, the Chinese space agency, and specifically this dude right here, the Chinese foreign minister, disagreed saying that this was not them and it actually wasn't their booster role because their booster re-entered Earth atmosphere and they've even tracked it previously. And even though NASA sort of dropped it at this point, the amateur astronomers or the independent astronomers, such as Bill Gray, did not. They're now absolutely convinced that it was Chang'e 5T and that the foreign minister misspoke, for one simple reason. He was actually referring to the Chang'e 5 mission, the one where the booster did re-enter. Chang'e 5T1 mission was a lot less known and was actually barely announced at all, and so it's quite likely that the foreign minister was just not familiar with this mission at all. And because of the Chinese bureaucracy and because of the, you know, saving the face that they usually have in the Asian culture, chances are it was best for everyone to just drop it. Not the amateur astronomers, because honestly, when it comes to science, we tend to not get involved in politics, but NASA and all of the official NASA scientists decided to kind of leave it at that. Nevertheless, whatever happened with this particular collision is kind of intriguing. So first of all, the collision in this case happened with the far side of the moon. So basically not the side that we usually see from planet Earth, but the side that's sort of invisible to us. The side that's a little bit more difficult to recognize because it does look entirely different. If you'd like to find out why it looks so different, check out one of the previous videos that goes through the science of how the moon was created and what most likely happened to the moon in the last few billions of years, turning it into a completely different object from anything else we have in the solar system. The video should be somewhere right there or in the description below. But I think the most impressive part about this whole story is how extremely accurate the prediction of the collision were, both from the astronomer Bill Gray and from the JPL scientists. So they kind of had a bit of a competition going. They both made a prediction about where the actual booster is most likely going to hit the moon. The actual difference between their prediction was only about 8 kilometers. That would be equivalent to a tiny, tiny dot in this particular image. And following this, it took roughly a few months of searching for this particular spot to discover the actual collision that you see right here. This is the image of before and after. But the collision itself occurred about 8 kilometers away from where GPL predicted it to be, and also about 16 kilometers away from Bill Gray's prediction. So yeah, GPL wins. Obviously, kind of expected. But you might be asking, why exactly was the prediction not super accurate? Well, it's actually in regards to objects orbiting in the solar system. Pretty much everything in the solar system that orbits around the Sun, including various asteroids, receive a lot of pressure from the Sun itself. For example, one such effect is known as the Europe effect, we've discussed this in one of the older videos on the channel, and that's essentially how a lot of asteroids usually change their position and sort of change their orbit as they spin around and as the Sun puts different pressure on the asteroids as they orbit the Sun. So this is just one of many effects. The other effects also involve the heating of the object and the release of some of this heat as a kind of a pressure coming from the asteroid itself, but in a nutshell there are a lot of different effects and a lot of different ways for an asteroid or really any object, including a booster orbiting the Sun, or in this case orbiting the Moon and planet Earth, to change its orbit with time because of the solar pressure. And because this was a prediction approximately 4 months before it even happened, in this case the orbit could not be determined super precisely. But in the end, after just a few months of search, they found it. And it seems to be a double crater. Now one impressive thing about this is that it took approximately a few years to find the booster location for some of the Apollo missions. It took only a few months to find this. So this already means that we've improved so much in the last few years. But it doesn't change the fact that there is now a new mystery. Why is it a double crater? It's believed that when this booster collided with the moon, it was colliding under approximately 15 degree angle. But when it comes to asteroid collisions, generally double craters are produced when the angle is much 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 higher. An angle of 15 degrees should not produce any double crater at all. And so the only possible explanation in this case is that, well, maybe it's two objects. Or basically, this is maybe a way for us to finally identify what exactly collided with the moon. If this was a booster containing two parts, and in this case if the Chinese rocket actually had two parts, it would make a lot of sense. 
At the moment, the answer to this is currently unknown. But based on the orbital parameters, Chang'e 5T1 is still the best explanation. Here's actually what its orbit looked like with the Earth in the middle and the Moon around it. And as you can see, its orbit sort of intersects with the Moon once in a while. So it is kind of expected that, well, right around here somewhere, it might collide with the Moon, especially because the Moon, as you can see, disturbed its orbit. And the collision is right there. Now, I don't really expect the Chinese agency or the Chinese government to admit the mistake, but that's not really important. The important thing is that this is an absolutely incredible achievement. As a matter of fact, this is a mind-blowing achievement. Not only was the software able to predict this before it even happened, but it only took a few months for the scientists to identify the exact location where it happened, and now they're able to even study this by directly observing these images and by possibly predicting exactly what this contained in terms of shape and size, and maybe even modeling the collision in order to reproduce the same sort of shape. And so I bet in just a few months from now, we're probably going to hear more about what exactly they think happened here, and why exactly this was a double crater. So honestly, even though this might not sound like a super exciting story, the achievement here is absolutely mind-blowing. And it's also super important, especially for the new field of the so-called planetary defense. Nowadays, a lot of different scientific agencies are actively trying to develop new techniques in tracking various asteroids and in trying to predict potential collisions with planet Earth in order to prevent a potential disaster. I think in this case, the Chilevinsk meteor of 2013 was a kind of awakening for the entire scientific community. As you might be aware, this particular explosion was equivalent to like 20 Hiroshima bombs and was actually explosive enough to create a lot of damage in the city and to also cause approximately 1500 injuries, mostly due to the glass shards from the exploding windows. And so this, the ability to predict this and the ability to track this, is an important step in our ability to then maybe one day redirect a potentially dangerous asteroid using some of the missions that are currently testing new technologies. But you might want to learn more about this in some of the videos somewhere right there or in the description. But anyway, on that note, well, that's pretty much all I wanted to mention. I thought it was a pretty exciting story and it's actually a story that really showcases how far we've gone from being able to just see meteors and asteroids and possibly guess where they came from to essentially being able to track everything with extreme precision. And all of this in just a few decades. So if we continue on that track, imagine what's going to happen by the year 2050. Which also means that there are going to be so many more videos on this topic coming out in the next few years. So subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, and support this channel on Patreon by joining the channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.